One day, man invented the wheel. Then the guy in the next cave had a wheel, so man invented the race. Since then, we've gotten a lot more civilized. We've come up with all kinds of ways to race, always trying to prove who can drive the fastest or the longest. But some people just aren't satisfied with the challenge of car against car or man against man. They seek out the toughest courses man or nature can create, no matter where they find them. Then they strap themselves into the cars and say, hey, let's go for it. We call them the off-road warriors. People like to do things the hard way. Show them a six-lane freeway smooth as a billiard table, and sure as hell, they'll roar off up some dirt road and invent a new way to take chances. Give them a little time, and they might even come up with a new kind of race. Tell you what, they've already done just that. Mickey Thompson and his off-road warriors have captured the hard-driving spirit of the Baja and brought it back alive. 
Now people who know something about off-roading and driving a little too fast can be part of a new kind of American sport. A brand new challenge to drivers and the killer machines they push to the limit. The limit and beyond is Baja. Thousands of square miles of rock and sand, dirt and cactus and rattlesnakes just south of the border near San Diego. What brings a man to no man's land? Who knows? It's a chance to race with not many rules, and it's a chance to be with his kind of people. But it's more than that. In a world where everything seems like it's packaged and processed and computerized, the Baja 1000 is one of the last primitive challenges on Earth. It is driver and car alone against everything else. All you gotta do is finish. This is Ensenada, Mexico. For 364 days a year, it's a sleepy little village on the Pacific. Sometimes it seemed like the clock stopped here a hundred years ago. But for one day every year, the walls and windows of Ensenada rattle from the roar of engines tuned up for racing. This is the starting line. You'll find every kind of racer here you can imagine. Men and women, teenagers and senior citizens, they all have their own reasons for coming, but they, they all have the same fantasy, that they can beat everybody else to the other end and win the toughest title in sports. Then it's your turn in front of the guy with the green flag. You've done all the preparing you can do. You hope there's not some bolt somewhere that somebody's overlooked. There's a chill in the air and the smell of gas and oil. All around you are the drivers who've been up most of the night with the excitement. Then the flag goes down and you're on your way out into the desert. There's only one way to go back, and that's forward. And there's almost any kind of car here, too. From trucks, it looked like someone took a can opener to them, especially built cars you wouldn't even find anywhere else. As in any race, there are classes the cars have to fit in, based on engine size, number of seats, and whether they have two-wheel drive or four. The Volkswagen Beetle is still in a class by itself at Baja. There may be dinosaurs in the U.S., but 
The bug still proves every year that it's about as durable as any car around. driver and the co-driver if there is one and the crew there's a fine line you cannot cross you've got to drive as hard as you can to have a chance at winning but you can't push the car beyond its limits the good driver knows where that line is you're driving flat out okay but with some kind of reservation you know it's kind of a sprint race for a thousand uh drag race for a thousand miles you're going from one loop to doo to the other and it's a long long way well, I think, you know, the, the toughest part you got to do is be able to know how fast you can go with your car without tearing it up. Try to stay calm. <laughs> That's the hardest That's the part. Problem. Yeah, getting psyched up is, works against you. So it's trying to stay calm, get through the first 10 miles. That's where you're going to be hyper. Then once you get out there, just the racing relaxes you and you'll set into a pace and try to set up a nice even pace. Try to keep out of trouble and not do anything stupid and hope the car holds us together. Well, I think that the only strategy we're going to use is just go out and try to run as far, as fast as we can and, and uh, hope for the best. And it's really rough. It's going to take its toll on the cars. Well, I'm trying to get here, Skinner, third. I'll let somebody else have first. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh it's hard to guess. Just whoever, whoever the ground don't beat. dust in front of you and you can't quite get him you know at the right time that you want but uh so it's really a lot of patience that that'll pay off for you especially in this thing get your head together and think about getting down there what you want to do is finish you can you could probably go slower than anybody but as long as you finish you'll place master cylinder a wheel cylinder a throttle cable braking last year was an axle they, they lose their logic it's the uh well nothing's going to happen so they they know that their car has certain limits, and you have to stay within that range, but still do 100%. driver but like Mickey you know you can be the best driver in the world but it takes a 10 cent part and it'll put you out on a big ditch too fast, wipe the sweat off. <laughs> what do we got in this uh, bag here, Brian? Hey, there's uh, wrenches. No, the food's up for there. There's some food. Are you serious? Here. Yeah, there is. You Don't eat, eat it, though. <laughs> Don't eat it. It's though. been there for a long time. <laughs> All it is is you in the desert, and this thing will get you around. But a guy like Thompson, who's a bona fide lunatic, see, he opens it up. That's why he always breaks. You know, everybody says, that's what Thompson breaks. He's crazy. He'd win any race that he could finish, but it breaks. had a problem with the car. I got it upside down yesterday and they had to work all night long on it so we really don't know exactly how the car is going to handle but uh, I believe uh, we just put new shock absorbers on it and it's going to be a problem there. Good luck Mario! Good luck to you. 
Uh, and uh, That was your problem from yesterday, right? Yeah, so we're starting a race not really knowing what's going to happen, but we're going to have to push the car. The car's going to be awful hard and it's going to beat the heck out of us, but uh, we're going to give it a big try. The first thing you notice is the dust. The further back you are, the more there is. The urge is to get around someone and try to get in front of it. You can play it cautious and wait for an opening, or you can simply try to outrun them all. Mickey Thompson has tackled the Baja a lot of times in a lot of different cars. And for him, there's only one way to go. And everybody knows what that is. Memorial? Good luck. You're starting, what, right in front of us, huh? Yes. Okay, very good. Hey, number four. Memorial, why don't you say something to these guys here? You're the first guy off. Well, I'm close to the first guy off. You're number one. What's your strategy going to be? Four. A number four off. Number four. Number four. Just keep it together. Don't put any wrenches on the car, run a steady pace. You know, you can just make a nice steady pace, run your race, don't run someone else's. That's, I think, the best way to do it. Ask, Mor ask, Morio, ask Morio what he's gonna say when I pass him up. Is he gonna run his own race or is he gonna take off? <laughs> no, 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 Vicky. No contest, won't chase you. <laughs> no, you go wrong by. Just don't tap me too hard. <laughs> just don't I want you to listen this more. All right. Okay. Remember that. Hard. I'll remember it. <laughs> Sincerely. Yes. Good luck. Baja course is a ragged line that runs across open desert and dry lake and stream beds a lot of the time. But occasionally it crosses a main highway. That's where the pit crews wait to gas up the cars, to change the tires if they need it, to tighten up whatever has come loose, to give the drivers a few seconds to get out of the car. It's usually long enough to worry about how many cars are passing them. Somebody who could make wheels and tires tougher than rocks could make a fortune down here. More often than not, the Baja beats the cars and the motorcycles here. And when the machine takes a beating, the driver does too.
but it is a race. And sometimes, even in all this desert, there isn't room for two cars on the same road. Speed in this race means you eat less dust. The cars and bikes are all fast and there are places on the course where you can gain time with speed. But more than anything else, the cars have to be able to take a pounding more savage than anything your car could ever endure. Even on the smooth spots, it's a hell of a ride. Then, almost before you know it, you're all alone in the desert. It's like being on a long trip on the worst highway in the world and you're not absolutely sure you didn't take the wrong turn about 50 miles back. You listen for every little sound your engine makes. You think of all the time and sweat and money you put in the car and you know you've got to finish. Besides, you don't want to walk very far in this country.
This is Jack Murphy Stadium in San Diego. I used to play football here. Lots of memories. But what they're doing down there on the field now is building a special kind of track. One that'll bring all of the bone-jarring action of the Baja all into one place. So you can see, hear, and feel the excitement of maybe a dozen different races and you don't have to share your seat with a family of rattlesnakes. But before off-road racing grew into the super stadiums across the country, Mickey Thompson took it to the legendary raceway at Riverside, California. He knew the one thing that was missing in the Baja, people to watch the action. So in 1973, he built a course, brought in the cars and the drivers, but this time fans could see it all, and they got it. The speed, the dust, an unpredictable course, and lots of competition. But this time there was more head knocking and fender bending. It was action multiplied. But before off-road racing grew into the super stadiums across the country, Mickey Thompson took it to the legendary raceway at Riverside, California. He knew the one thing that was missing in the Baja, people to watch the action. So in 1973, he built a course, brought in the cars and drivers, but this time the fans could see it all, and they got it. The speed, the dust, an unpredictable course, and lots of competition. But this time there was more head knocking and fender bending. It was action multiplied. The fans loved it, and they still do.
Extra Girls and Watermelon Off-Road Racing's third. Fun, excitement, radical people, <laughs> racing. It's fun to watch, get some rollovers. It's the best sport. You never know what's going to happen. That's the main thing, I think. They fly across tracks here, and they gotta, they got to be tough to hold together. The speed, the excitement. They're faster, they're hotter. You got your trucks, you got your... Uh, single seat unlimited you got your two seat unlimited you got your little guys in your limited horsepower cars running it you know just running it into the ground so you can't do nothing else there's tension but there's it's it's a really thrilling experience when i say mickey thompson's name what comes to mind <clears throat> racing <laughs> uh i enjoy mickey i i look forward to seeing the cars that he drives they're they're fascinating they're unique and uh he's just um He's a real important person, I feel, in, in off-road racing's beginning. And uh, I'm, I'm really glad that he sort of got into this type of thing. And I enjoy I always look for Mickey. Mickey Thompson, you're responsible for all this. Uh, 35, 40 different races in Baja. Uh, it's a lot of work for people to get down there and get a good vantage point. So you brought Baja racing to them. What made you think you could bring Baja to uh, stadiums? Well, actually, it's, 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 it's really a short story. I in 1973 was racing with Pernelli Jones and we had the damnedest race that anybody ever had for about a hundred miles and we ran in each other and uh, he finally flipped his car and uprighted it and we banged finish for I guess uh, at least a hundred miles and the only people I ever saw it was the rattlesnakes and the jackrabbits and uh, during that time I thought you know people aren't going to believe this someday I'm going to bring this type of racing inside a beautiful stadium like the San Diego Stadium The place Mickey Thompson chose for this auto racing experiment was a place with the tradition of the Olympics behind it, the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. In 1979, he convinced the Coliseum commissioners he could build a track inside the Coliseum and stage a race that would be safe and exciting. It was the first ever off-road Grand Prix championship event held in a stadium that was not designed for racing. So what you and Parnelli had so much fun doing now, people will be able to uh, come into a stadium and enjoy a comfort of a nice uh, seat and watch and uh, enjoy it uh, just like you wish they could have when you and Parnelli were banging away in Baja. Absolutely, and that's men, women, and children. It's not just a man's sport now. I mean, you know, we race all types of vehicles. And I mean, just not the pickup trucks and the, and the single-seaters, but we race the ATVs, three- and four-wheelers. We race the Odysseys. And I'll make a prediction, Ben, within the next two or three years, once the people come inside and see this presented as a family sport, you're going to see a huge influx of people coming to see off-road racing. And we have hardcore racers. I mean, we have people like uh, Roger Mears, Ivan Ironman Stewart, and we have some of the greatest and best drivers uh, in the world, our rally driver thing, racing here with us. Valvoline Motor Oil Company was putting up $500. Uh, for anybody that could solo the Baja 1000 or the Baja 500, do the whole race and win the race driving solo and you win this Ironman trophy and the $500. Well, I was fortunate enough to do that three different times, once in a thousand, twice in the Baja 500. And actually, it was Mickey Thompson that started calling me the Ironman of off-road racing. It was really stuck and I'm really thankful for that reason. The stadium racing has evolved from desert racing or Baja type of racing. That's what Mickey Thompson has done, is put, tried to simulate a piece of Baja here inside the stadium. But I do do both, both types of racing and complete different types of driving style. For example, to do the 1000, you have to drive very methodical and very smooth, take care of the equipment, uh, never jam it in gear, never jerk it around. We're just on the other hand, here at the stadiums, it's just the opposite. Everything has to be done with a uh, violent, quick, and no time to spare. Uh, very difficult uh, to make that transition. Actually, I think it's, it may be a little bit easier to be competitive, be competitive driver in desert racing uh, than it is in short course. Like I say, it, it's very violent, very quick, uh, no room for errors, distance racing like a thousand. 
Uh, you can make a few little errors and catch up for it, providing the air doesn't take you off the road or into a tree. A small driver errors can be made up for it. Uh, short course racing is a little different deal. A little more uh, aggressive and uh, no mistakes. Stadium. Uh, as a football player, I'm a little worried about the uh, grass underneath there, Becky. Oh, well, you should be, uh, but we really uh, work on that. Actually, the grass has all been taken out, uh, and uh, we have three sheets or two sheets of plywood, and we have uh, kinds of plastic material, and they protect it. We make sure that it doesn't get contaminated in any way, and then we come back, pull all this dirt off, and there's 300 truckloads of dirt in here. And we come back and re -sod it. It costs about $40,000 to put the grass back in, and it's about $125,000 just to put the track in that you see here today. Let's talk about these uh, things we're sitting on. Mickey, you <laughs> developed these. and Tell us a little bit about your uh, inventions here. Well, we call them hydro barriers, Ben. Uh, instead of using the cement concrete barriers like they have in the middle of freeways, which are actually dangerous when a car hits it while you know you can see they climb the walls and get upside down. Well, we didn't want to hit them with race cars. So this is made of actually polyethylene. They weigh about 100 pounds a piece and they're filled with water. Uh, there's about 1,300 pounds of water in here. When a car hits it, it impacts it and it doesn't hurt the car. And uh, we move the barriers and uh, people don't get hurt. And uh, I think uh, eventually, in the not too distant future, uh, DuPont's been helping us a lot in this thing. And I think you'll see these in a free race taking the place 
of concrete barriers. And they're all connected, each one's got a uh, hinge, so to speak, down between them. And right, they're, they're all coupled. Uh, there's actually a pipe that goes down here, and if we want, and later on, we'll build this up here, this high, and then we'll put rails so the cars can't go over the fence. They contact the soft water barrier here, and then so they won't go to the fence, why we'll put different kinds of rails, so we can stack any kind of rail or make any kind of safety barricade we want. So it's a real safe thing, and the drivers really love it. Uh, in fact, uh, they try to put hay bales up and stuff like that, or tires, this goes right through a hay bale. So this is actually the way it has to be done inside of a stadium like this. And you've specially developed these uh, so you can take your show to stadiums anywhere in the country and uh, pack them inside the uh, moving vans? And... That's right. It takes five moving vans to move this. It takes 11 men. You see right now working the stadium uh, over 50 men. It takes all week long to build the barricades, and we only race three hours on it. Can we expect to see a little bit of fender banging tonight? Not only can you expect it, I'll guarantee it. Glenn Harris in the Mazda on the pole, and he has the advantage at the start, but Jeff Huber in the Ford making a strong move right behind him. They head down the back straightaway over the steel jumps created by Mickey Thompson and used here at this Orange Show Fairground Speedway. It is Glenn Harris with the lead as they go onto the dirt for the first time in this 10-lap main event, and Jeff Huber's right behind him, and they've already built up a big lead. Right now, it is Glenn Harris trying to hold on to a rather precarious lead at the moment as the Ford of Jeff Huber closes as they come onto the asphalt, and Huber spins out. He sure does. Look at that. He stayed on the throttle. He brought it all the way around 360 degrees, and he's back in the race. The Iron Man, 39-year-old Ivan Stewart, challenging for the lead at the end of lap number four. It is Stewart in second place, Harris in the lead, and Jeff Huber remains in the third spot. They come down the back straight away, and Stewart comes in hot. He spins it out as the truck comes a spinning around, and there goes Jeff Huber into the number two spot. Stewart is asking for a push from the safety crew. They back him up out of the way. Maybe he can get the truck restarted. I don't know. Obviously, it won't start under its own power. Here's Jeff Huber now challenging the Mazda of Glenn Harris for the lead. The crew pushing hard on his pickup truck and they bring it to life. Ivan Stewart is back in the race. And how close behind is Huber? You can see it there. Just a few feet separate these two trucks. Glenn Harris goes into the turn. There's some slower traffic ahead of him. Jeff Huber dips down to the inside and they collide behind the slower traffic. And Jeff Huber is in the lead. There's a lot of body work coming off of Glenn Harris's truck as we see him pulling up behind Huber. Oh, the parts and pieces are flying. Look at the hood flying up on Glenn Harris's Mazda. There goes the bumper. The hood is just flying in the breeze. It's made out of fiberglass. It's very lightweight. But when it flies up, how does he see? Boy, it's real tough. And now it's peeled back all the way against the windshield. With about two and a half laps to go, look at the problems facing Glenn Harris. He can't see. The hood has now come down in front of his vision. He is literally, Kelly, feeling his way around this racetrack. He's doing a remarkable job out there, Dave, trying to work his way over those bumps, probably using a lot of the crash walls to see where he's going. Jeff Huber knows where he's going, hopefully to the checkered flag. But Steve Millen is beginning to make a charge on Harris, and there goes the hood, and here comes Harris as they battle down that short straightaway towards the asphalt. It's Steve Millen on the inside, and Glenn Harris just squirts around him to the outside and has retained second place. They come down the straightaway over the bumps. At the end of lap number eight, there goes another piece. Jeff Huber's in the lead. Glenn Harris with nothing but his radiator hanging out in front is in second, and Steve Millen is in third. Several hundred feet of dirt separate the first place truck, the Ford of Jeff Huber, from the Mazda of Glenn Harris. That's the one without the front end. There's no body work left, and they're running into each other again. What a race we have for second place tonight. Glenn Harris is really doing a great job holding off Steve Millen, and Millen is virtually driving over his tailgate to get around him. There is only one lap left in this race, actually less than that, as they go over the bumps for the final time. Jeff Huber just trying to point his truck around in a safe and sane manner, while behind him goes on the battle of the century in the Grand National Sport Trucks. Look at him fly over the bumps, and a 
guarantee you Glenn Harris just drove over the back of Steve Millen. Dave, Glenn is not lifting off of that throttle. He cleared almost two complete jumps on one of those last ones, and he is staying right in there. And what he also cleared was the right rear fender of the Toyota of Steve Millen. Here is Jeff Hubers Ford coming onto the asphalt where he spun earlier, but coming up now, he's got the checkered flag and the big win in one of the most exciting races that you could have asked for in any form of motorsport. Here is the battle for second. This is Glenn Harris. He has done everything in his power to try to retake the lead, but just finishing second with the problems he's had is remarkable. Right behind him is Steve Mellon. What a tremendous night of excitement. On stadium racing, the action never stops. Not even when there's a break between races, because that's when the big guys come out to play. And I do mean the big guys. <laughs>
I got started in racing many years ago when we lived on a farm in New Zealand and my dad bought, built us a go-kart and we used to go out and race the go-kart in paddocks and local clubs and so on like that. And I think it's a bug that, you know, that we got started with and you just couldn't shake it out of my blood. I think being raised on a farm and, and driving tractors on the dirt and paddocks and so on, learnt car control and, and this is applied in short course racing here today. I've driven Formula Atlantic, some Super V and currently doing a lot of IMSA racing. Some in prototype cars and sometimes in the big sedans, the GTO class. And uh, I'm very lucky to be doing so many different types of racing. The off-road racing is very, very difficult, particularly these stadium events because to set the chassis up to make it corner well and to make it get good traction plus get through all this rough stuff and over these different sized jumps is very difficult and it's something that you don't deal with in any other type of motorsport and it is frustrating sometimes because some of these courses are so short in the straights and so tight in the corners and uh, because they invert the grid for the main heat for the, for the heats and the mains uh, sometimes you get behind a guy who you know is slower and you can't get by him and uh, you've got to control yourself, you do, you know, because uh, you want to get by, you want to get by and win the race and it's, uh, it's difficult. In New Zealand the country is very small, opportunities are very limited, so to come to America and to be racing full time is just a dream come true and, uh, and I wouldn't change it for anything, you know, it's just, uh, it's great to be living here. As off-road racing has grown, so is the popularity of the sport truck class. A lot of fans drive theirs to the race, but that's where the similarity stops. If you don't watch him, this gent right here will take a perfectly good truck and transform it into a snarling beast, a road-eating, race-winning monster like this little beauty right here. Jim Connors, this is one of your new trucks. Let's tell us a little about it now. First of all, the most obvious thing, tell us about the shocks. Yeah, everybody seems to notice that right away. Well, you know, if you think about it, a regular car like most people drive has about two or three or four inches of wheel travel, so plenty of room to put the shocks under the hood. We get about 14 or 15 inches out of this thing, so there isn't any place to go but out through the top of the hood with the shocks. And hopefully they stay hooked down here and uh, don't... Yeah, most of the time they do. <laughs> Sometimes they don't, but it sure helps to make a smooth ride. While we're up here up front, let's talk about the uh, tires on these trucks. Well, I'd have to think that the tires are probably about the most important thing in an off-road vehicle because you have to have all four of them working real well. It seems to me one time you ran a celebrity race. And how many tires did we go through for you? About 17? Well, um, Something like that. There were a lot, okay, of, 50. a lot of glass on the road, Jim. Yeah. But we can't afford to do that, so we have to have some pretty good tires. And There's been a lot of development, I think, uh, through the years with off-road tires, and I think it's helped everybody on the street because they make some pretty darn good tires now. One of those instances of uh, racing technology helping the, uh, your average motorist. I well, I think if, if that isn't going to help the average motorist, then we wouldn't be in racing. Jim, what about this engine? Well, that's that 16-valve uh, twin overhead cam Nissan motor. Uh, puts out about 300 horsepower, and uh, you can see it's side draft McCuny carburetors, and basically it's just a flat-out race motor, and it uh, performs really well, and uh, it's very reliable. We... Uh, We've been using this same motor now for a good portion of this year. Jim, is there any part of this truck that's uh, stock? Well, yeah, the cab and the frame, and the frame just a little bit. But no, there's not too much that's, that's left the way it was when it came off the showroom floor. What's this truck worth, Jim? Well, uh, I'm not exactly sure, but I imagine it's well over $100,000, which uh, sure is a change in off-roading since five or six years ago when you could build anything for fifteen thousand dollars. Jim, why the uh, net here? Well, we don't like to think that we're ever going to roll these trucks over when we're racing, but certainly you do once in a while, and if you roll over and your arms are inside, you could probably roll all day and not hurt yourself in one of these, but the worst thing that can happen is an arm going out the window, and it's a natural reflex, and this will keep the arm from going out the window. That's all they're for. A lot like football. You want to keep your arms in and don't have uh, part, body parts sticking out. There's nobody to tear them off. How about uh, inside here, Jim? Well, it's looking 
inside the cockpit here. How about these seats? They're exotic. They're also expensive, but they're also darn comfortable. And, and as a driver, uh, anything that's comfortable is real important to me, especially after 15 hours of an off-road race. Anything that uh, uh, feels good on your fanny is real important. What about up here? Uh, you've got uh, rear, front, and uh, one as yet unnamed uh, <laughs> all reservoir. The all the master cylinder reservoirs and stuff. Well, everything, again, has got to be easily accessible. If we need to fill it or work on it, we've got to have them right here. And, of course, when you're driving, you can watch the fluid and make sure that everything's up to snuff. It's like the air, air cleaner that you see over there on the right-hand side. We found out through the years of going through all that silt down in Baja that uh, when the air cleaners are up here and under the hood, they get all clogged up and they just come to a stop. Now we got them inside. It's a lot cleaner, and if you have to change them, it's a lot easier to change them up there. So uh, have you ever changed one on the run with your co-driver uh, throwing sure. your air filter in there? Sure. Done it before. You'd like to do it on me. hit a nice uh, not-so-dusty stretch, but let him change it. Sure. That's why it's there. And I see you have a fire extinguisher. Always have safety stuff. You know, you got a fire extinguisher, and most of the trucks have a flame-out system or onboard system. And racing, you know, that's the only thing that scares us to death is, is fire. Jim, I was going to ask you to borrow this to uh, move with, but uh, you don't have a whole lot of room in here. Kind of filled uh, up the rear what of is it, this? didn't we? Uh, tell us about the uh, quick, quick fill fuel. Well, uh, we always use a fuel cell, and it's hidden underneath the floor there. But uh, as you can see, we can fill from either side, and we can fill it in about, uh, oh, probably 20 seconds and be on our way. But that's why there's one on each side. Jim, I noticed the tire sticks out past the bumper. Uh, there's not a little bumping going on in off-road racing, is there? Yeah, you're right. The tire sticks out there, and it's, uh, it's certainly softer for uh, the person behind to bump into, and it protects our truck a little bit if it should happen. But... Uh, we like to think we're going fast enough in this truck that nobody's going to run into us from behind. But uh, once in a while it happens, and that keeps damage from the car behind us and from us if the tire's hanging there. I remember the uh, Lincoln Continentals used to have this, Jim, the uh, <laughs> Continental kit. Very tasteful. And I presume this is a uh, quick release, Jim. Sure, uh, it just spins right. Spins. Oh, uh, yeah, it, just, it just spins right off. There's not a problem with it that way here. Very tasteful. You're an aggressive driver. Uh, say a, a vehicle that started earlier than you is uh, impeding your progress and you've got no way to pass. What do you do? The only thing I can do, Ben, is compare it to football. When somebody's impeding your progress in football, what do you do? You move out of the way, right? A little, uh, little bump. Well, uh, same way with, uh, with off-road racing. You get up behind him, you give him a courtesy tap and uh, if they don't move over the horn. And usually, sometimes you tap them twice, but after you tap them twice, uh, the big problem is the rocks fly up and they break your lenses out. And the most dangerous place in off-road race is running behind somebody. So you tap one, tap twice, they don't move out of the way, you move them out of the way. And I've been known to move people out of the way once in a while. <laughs> never want to be in front of you. No, just like you, you never want to be in front of a football player unless you're prepared. memories of Baja, including uh, memories of a win, and some memories of uh, not finishing either. Uh, tell us about that. Well, Ben, first I'd like to tell you is I want to be a professional football player. I'm very jealous of a person like yourself that uh, could be. I just never grew enough to, to do it, but I've had a lot of good memories in Baja. And, uh, of course, my best win is uh, we won uh, two years ago, the win of Baja 1000, and set new records. We ran it in... Uh, a little uh, under 20 hours, which is the fastest time ever, and of course that's all the way to tip. But, but I've uh, had a lot of non-finishes too. I'm the kind of person that uh, second it doesn't count, only winning counts. And uh, I'd rather break a car than not, you know, to be second. Yeah. One of the more exciting 1000s that I ran was the 1976. It was called the Wet and Wild 1000. Uh, it was scheduled to be raced on a Saturday, and it rained so hard that they couldn't put it on. They had to wait till the next day. And uh, it's kind of treacherous condition because it rains so hard it works a lot of the road out. So all these roads that you knew 
uh, coming over a rise that was going to be a good road or no longer a good road, they were washed out. So, And I remember there's a uh, an area down there called uh, Laguna Salada, and it was just a disastrous, mud, uh, uh, muddy, uh, disastrous uh, event even getting across it. But I made it across and went on to win the race. But that was, uh, the Wet and Wild 1000 was one of the most uh, exciting ones I've done.
NFL would want to hang it up and raise tulips. I guess I like banging around. Hell, there's a little off-road warrior in all of us. By the way, if you decide to ease on down to the Baja and make the rattlesnake run, keep your eye on the road. That is, if you can find the road. problem I had today was finding the finish line. You found it. That's the important thing, right? Yeah, par pardon me just one second here. Let me let me take this. Uh, Jack, do you have any problem? Any falls or anything like that? Nothing nothing close to it or anything like that? No, no problems. I checked all the nods off the tire and stop and change, but that's all. Just 
Yeah, we were we were just going for it there for a while. That turn you blew, you blew so bad. Did you see me just go out in those bushes? Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, it was awesome. Oh, that's real. Yeah.